Segabits presents Sega Talk, a podcast talking all things with your hosts, George and Barry. Look, it's a giant talking egg. I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to the master here. So what's up? Hello, everyone, and welcome to a new episode of the Sega Talk podcast. I'm your host, George. With me is Barry. Happy New Year. Yeah, this is our first episode for the new year, and we're not that excited about it, but we're going to go into it <laughs> trying to think positively. But right. uh, the third, this is our first third-party game being you know covered by us on this podcast. We usually only do Sega published games, but this time we're doing Power Stone. And if you're sitting there saying, wait, isn't that a Sega game? You're wrong. It's an, actually a Capcom game, and this is actually something that I always see online. Like mm-hmm. I always see people talking like, Oh, when is Sega going to make a new Power Stone game? It's a Capcom <laughs> game. I'm sorry to tell you that. And it launched... It was a Dreamcast launch game, and it launched September in America. It's September 9th, 1999. What an easy... 9999. Easy mm-hmm. to remember. And uh, a lot of people... You know, well, I already said right now that a lot of people think this is a Sega game. Why do you think that is, Barry? I think a lot of the reasons are that Capcom really hasn't capitalized off it or made it their own since then. I mean, outside of the PSP release, which we'll talk a little bit about later, they, you don't see them much, so I don't think they've really cemented the fact that it's a Capcom game. I think also being a launch title, being uh, on Naomi Hardware, which is a Sega hardware, and I'll be honest, it doesn't really look like a, a Capcom game. In some instances, and I, it does kind of have a Sega feel to it. it. Has like a kind of like what Sega was going for during that era, where like Jet Set Radio was this whole like thick lined characters. I yeah. felt like this Capcom was trying to do that same thing with Power Stone, and they did they did have them in uh, Capcom versus SNK, some card game for the Neo Geo Pocket, but nobody really played that game. So right, right. Let's not talk about that, but yeah. Uh, What's your history with the game, Barry? Well, this was... um, I'm trying to think back. So the Sega Dreamcast, when it came out, the the console came with a preview disc. Remember that? It was the orange orange packaging. It said, um, what was it, like playable playable bits and video clips? Yeah. Stuff like that. Yeah, Yeah, and and Power Stone was one of the demos on there. There was a lot of videos, but Power Power Stone was one of the few demos. And so I remember playing the hell out of that. And like, I was not a big fighting game fan. I never owned fighting games before then. I owned a lot of beat-em-ups, but the game just scratched that itch for me. It just, it played like a beat-em-up, but it was a fighting game and I had to get it. So um, I think after Sonic Adventure, Power Stone might've maybe been my second Dreamcast game I purchased. I've had that a long time. And I just, I played a lot of it with my friends. I played a lot more Power Stone 2 than Power Stone 1, but um, looking back, I wish I played more of 1 because it is it is in a surprisingly deep and fun game, and I'll be honest, I think the simplicity helps it when you compare it to the sequel. I agree, yeah. So, um, and I guess a, a funny little aside, uh, the character Falcon, who is named Fokker in the uh, Japanese <laughs> version, he was the inspiration for my... Uh, Fantasy Star Online character, which was a human hunter, and I named him Fokker. And I thought, oh, be- because I like Power Stone. And everyone made fun of the name. They were like, oh, like Meet the Parents? <laughs> because yeah. I was, because they, they changed the name, and I was so pissed off. I was like, no, like Fokker and, pa- and Power Stone, you know? And it's a sh- it's an airplane, too. And they are like, oh, no. no hey, you, Fokker. <laughs> yeah, you've been a- Stiller fan. Yeah, and they would do it like, oh, I have nipples, can you milk me? And I'm like, oh, <laughs> shut up. Anyway, those uh, are my happy memories. How about you? Um, I, I got this game as a like a launch title, like whatever month that I got the Dreamcast, because they didn't have Sonic Adventure. Like, Sonic Adventure was such a huge game for the Dreamcast. It was sold out in all the places I went to. Mm. And I, I had to choose, so I'm looking through them. I was thinking about Soul Calibur, and I was like, nah, I want something that... M- people that I hang out with at the time would enjoy more and I and I saw the anime look and Capcom's never steered me wrong I was I'd been a big Capcom fan growing up so I picked it up just on on the look of it picked it up I really 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 enjoyed it I didn't really think it was going to be that type of game Mm because I mean we'll get into it in the next question but it's very unique 
in, especially in that time period, it was actual 3D gameplay. It wasn't like even Virtual Fighter, which is 3D, it's supposedly, it's yeah. still a 2D plane. This was like isometric, weird camera angle. And, you know, it was fun, especially when you had more than one player. Right. And I think it's worth noting, too, that the Dreamcast, at the time, when it when it launched, that was really the first home console that really nailed 3D, and 3D wasn't um, a, a stumbling block or, or something that they really had to overcome. And still trying to, and still trying to develop, you know? Because, like, yeah, a lot of the PlayStation and N64 games either felt really samey or they felt... Um, like, they were very limited. Fog effects, stuff like that, but yeah. Mm-hmm. Go on. I'm sorry. Well, actually, uh, let's get into the next question, because I think the next stuff I want to talk about actually ties right in with that. Okay, yeah. So we were talking about the gameplay, and I, this is a totally different fighting game than everything else. So why, I mean, what are your thoughts on the game and uh, its gameplay that it introduced? Well, I think it was just a lot faster than people were ever used to in 3D games. Uh, you look at the you know classic 2D fighting games of the same era that uh, Virtua Fighter came out. Virtua Fighter is slow, like so slow. It's such yeah. a slow game, and I think the reason for that was both the technical uh, you know capabilities at the time, and also the fact that I don't think they felt that people were ready for super fast 3D gameplay. And yeah. And Power Stone, by comparison to a lot of other 3D fighters, even at the time, it's so fast. It's super fast. It is pretty fast, I agree. And uh, I, it's also real 3D, which... And then one thing that really amazed me when they came out, I don't know if it amazed you, but picking up items and throwing them at people. I mm-hmm. thought that was the coolest thing. And it was like... My friend always compared it, and I've seen people online compare it to like Smash Brothers because they're both kind of party games where you could play with multiple people. I just felt like this was a, a step up. Like I think Capcom played Smash Bros. and they're like, oh yeah, this party thing, yeah, it could take off. And they mm-hmm. did their own 3D spin on it, and I think they did a better job, at least compared to the first Smash Bros. Yeah, now correct me if I'm wrong, I'm not a big Smash Bros. player, but the, the way you take damage in that, it's more of like a building up a percentage, correct? That's right, yeah. Yeah, and so I, I, I remember playing Power or Power Stone, Smash Brothers, a few times, and I just never got into it because I, I felt some of the things. I felt like Nintendo was intentionally playing it safe, so that they couldn't, um, you know, bring in the typical fighting game things like health bars and just kicking the shit out of people. And so I felt it was, it was really great that it wasn't about throwing someone out of the ring. At least that's yeah. what I recall. It, it's more about just kicking the shit out of them. And trying to get, you know, all the items. And like you said, too, with the items, it was it was just amazing that certain characters, if they were smaller, they could spin around a uh, like a lamppost. Whereas a larger character, they could rip it out of the ground and hit you with it. Yeah. It that was business. really fascinating. Yeah. 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 And uh, they also had, the obviously, the Power Stones, which is in the name of the game. So Yeah. But they would appear in treasure boxes, and you would be able to pick them up, and then, or they would appear around the map too. I think, right? Mm-hmm. Just randomly. I and, believe uh, so. So you would have to pick them up, and then whoever got uh, three of them, I want to say, mm-hmm. would uh, transform into their super powerful move, kind of Super Saiyan. I mean, one of the characters literally looked like Super Saiyan. Yeah, Wang uh, Tang. Yeah, Wang Tang, the Chinese character. I think he's Chinese. He was my main. <laughs> yeah, he was a ni- he was a, a nicely designed character, and he was really good for uh, when you first played. Is uh, he's pretty simple moves. He has a spare bomb. Mm-hmm. But yeah, mm-hmm. so you would have to pick up the things, and if you hit the other guy before, they would drop one of the power stones. So it was kind of a that was the party gimmick of it, where you would take massive damage if you collected these, but everybody was trying to frantically try to hit each other so they wouldn't collect the power stones. Uh, what do you think about that gameplay? Uh, kind of twist to it I enjoyed it I, I can see how some people might not have liked it just because it felt less like a typical fighting game because of course there was that tug of war with the stones and also how you know it's kind of like with the all-star moves in the uh, Sonic and Sega games where it it's an obvious way to make uh, novice players have more of an edge because you might you might not be that great at the game like I was at the time, but if you get the Power Stones, you can kick your enemies' butts. And I, f- I think I actually spent more time as I played the game trying to figure out how to get the stones as fast as I could and learning how to 
have people drop them, and then I would I would figure out exactly what the right moves were to just like kill everything, you know. <laughs> and so yeah, that's the type of player I was, and it, maybe that's cheap, but hey, I was playing the game and I was winning, so I don't care. Yeah, screw you guys. I was yeah. gonna say uh, they, they also had like a new health system in this one. It was mm -hmm. like little capsules. And uh, they would put, so if you would take down capsules, you basically had to take down all the capsules, right? Right. And what was your thought on that? Like, we, I was used to the health bar, you know, having the whole health bar, typical fighting game stuff. This one tried to change it. You think it was easier to keep track of? Or was it just, I don't know, weird? Yeah, it, it almost felt like they just took the standard health bar and broke it into chunks. It was almost like, you know, you were eating a, uh, like a Kit Kat bar or something where it would just like, Another bar would break off, and then or a Tolberone, Tolberone. Yeah, but, yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I think it might have worked better. I, I would say four players, but then again, they could have just put the health on the bottom corners and then continued the same obvious uh, health bar. I think the health bar has been. I think the one that Street Fighter uses is the easiest one to keep track of. I don't think they needed a new health bar or anything. Yeah, yeah. I, I that's one of the last things I think of about the game. Yeah, yeah, I know. I'm the only one that always looks at health bars and I'm like, why are your people trying to change the health bars? What is this garbage? Yeah. But uh, yeah, I mean, it was a good game. I had a good... The 3D effect is, I think, what sold it to everybody. That you could walk around, go through tables, go around post. And, uh, but it isn't a serious fighting game. Like, you're not pulling off combos. I mean, you could pull off combos. But mm -hmm. I think Capcom had this more for the mainstream party game. Like... You fight your friends over, they don't need that much lessons, you just tell them, like, this button does this, this button does that, just play. And mm -hmm. they'll figure it out. I think it's an easy game that anybody can figure out. Oh, for so, sure. Do uh, you want to talk to them about the characters? Yeah, absolutely. So the game launched with 10 playable characters, including uh, such classics that we, we no longer really talk about. Edward Falcon, a.k.a. Fokker in Fokker. the Japanese version. <laughs> Wang Tang. And Rouge, there were also characters like, I believe, um, there was Gunrock, and there was... I mean, they were all very memorable, um, uh, but... but I, I, well, they did do the whole thing where they take characters from, like, all around the world, sort of like Street Fighter, and then they... Mm -hmm. And then some of them come off a little like, oh, is that racist? I'm not sure. Cause, That's uh, true, yeah. Like, the, the Indian character, I was just like, is that racist to have them off, like, in a gear like that? I mean, I don't really care, but... I mean, yeah. is that how Indians always look now to us? I don't know. Um, <laughs> well, who was your favorite character? I mentioned Wang Tang. I played as him a lot. Who did you play as? I played as Falcon, and uh, I played as uh, Fokker. And yeah. uh, <laughs> there's a character that was like a cowboy with like this red uh, thing. Like he red was in mask. the sequel, and I played sequel as him character. all the time. Yeah, exactly. I played with him in the sequel, so we're not talking about the sequel. But yeah, I would play as Falcon on this one. I I didn't really branch. Uh, Jacko was kind of weird, a serial killer in the yeah. game. Yeah, yeah, uh, he was pretty much Jack the Ripper. Pretty much, yeah. And he's like supposedly they don't know how old he is, but he's like in his forties, which I guess in gaming talk to us, it would have been like, oh man, he's already an old man. Yeah. Uh, in the anime, they said that he was uh, well, maybe over 100 years old. So they added kind of a, a mystery to the character. But outside, I mean, they did have some weird characters, but they kind of like... Well, I'll tell them after this because it's the next question. But what's your favorite character? Um, I think outside of Wang Tang, which I'll be honest, I don't like the character of Wang Tang. I liked his super moves, especially the... Um, the one where you just drop the giant sun down from the sky because it would go do 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 and it would just be heavy the, damage. Um, the spirit bomb. Yeah, yeah, the spirit bomb. But outside of him, I I really liked Ryoma. He was the um, the samurai. samurai. Yeah, yeah, and his stage had some of the best music. I loved that music. It's the one where it was like needle 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 needle. Oh, and it's gonna be here in the background while you're listening to the podcast. Yeah, and enjoy. And oddly enough, and not to get too much into the sequel, he was on the cover of the sequel, and it was yeah. the, in in the U.S. and it was the worst cover art ever. I know oh, people yeah, talk yeah. about bust a move and stuff. It was terrible. I, you really, really hate that cover art, don't you? I hate it so much, especially when my stupid friend 
who always imported games, rubbed it in my face of how the sequel looked so good in Japan. He's like, look at this cover art. Isn't it beautiful? And I'm like, yeah, it's beautiful. And he's like, why do you have the American one? I'm like, because I'm an American, like you are, you fucking weeaboo or whatever he is. <laughs> uh, <laughs> what do you think about the cover for the uh, first game where it has Falco reaching out for a power stone and uh, Ro- Rouge, a rogue or whatever, trying yeah. to grab him by the pants, trying to pull his <laughs> pants down? I think it looks fine. I think it's actually a crop of the uh, the larger artwork that the Japanese one has, but I wish they carried that over. There's just the art, the artwork itself is beautiful. I actually have the um, the Capcom art book. I'm not. Ex- I think it's called Capcom Design Works. Power Stone and Power Stone Two only get four pages, and it's just the cover art and the character art. But oh, what a lovely four pages it is! And that's actually what we're going to talk about uh, next about how. What, do you think the character that Capcom has left this franchise and characters basically die? Like, yes. They have. They like. It didn't. I don't know if it panned out. I, I was reading an interview with one of the guys, and we have a quote from him later. But this yeah, is, I didn't put this quote in. But uh, he, they talked. They asked him if the game sold really bad in Japan, and he said, "Not really." This is like PR talk for yes, it mm-hmm. did sell bad, but fuck it. Um, <laughs> he said that uh, it didn't do bad because the Dreamcast did bad basically so it's not that big a deal but I'm like sure try to tell that to corp corporate and the, yeah. I think the way they handled the franchise after that after the Dreamcast basically says yeah they didn't sell enough on Dreamcast it didn't make people happy and yeah. so Sega just killed it off but what are your thoughts on this well I am I'm a very very casual um, Mega Man fan but I can imagine this is what Mega Man fans feel like, where Capcom has this amazing franchise just in their hands. Great gameplay, great legacy. People love the game. No one, I've never met anyone who goes, oh, Power Stone, hate it. Ugh, hate that game. I mean, even even Mega Man is kind of uh, diluted a bit with some of the games that came out and people go, oh, that one kind of sucked, you know? Yeah. And, and it's just, it, it boggles my mind that they have not returned to it, but I guess, the Capcom of this era is kind of dead, just in the sense that, you know, outside of, um, boy, what are we getting? Like, Street Fighter and Marvel vs. Capcom, there isn't really, like, bright and colorful, happy Capcom games anymore. It's a lot of more of the dark and gritty, big-budget games, and I, I'd love to see a Power Stone 3. And you know what? I, I'm not the biggest fan of the Nintendo Switch, but I feel like the Switch would be the best platform for a third Power Stone. For sure. Or at least for Capcom to re-release the first two, at least like the the way they did on PSP, but on the Switch. With, yeah, uh, and can I can I say why did they do it on PSP? <laughs> no idea. I, I I have no idea. That's actually a good question we could talk about later. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, they did kind of discarded, and I think there's a lot of other games they did the same thing with, like Rival Schools. They kind of uh, threw that aside. They threw uh, they. It's Capcom, so it's yeah. all, it's the same thing with Sega. We complain about it, I mean, but at least Sega is doing Daytona three, so right. And I'd say at least Sega makes an effort to make the games readily available on newer hardware when they can. I, or even with the Sonic and Sega All Stars Racing game, they show a lot of love and respect to the past. But I just I'm surprised that Capcom does not do more. With, with Power Stone, like, at all. Like, why isn't a Power Stone character even in Marvel vs. Capcom or any of those crossover games? It's perfect. I, no, I agree with you. And there's a, there's a rumor going around that in the new uh, Marvel whatever vs. Capcom Infinity that uh, yeah. Power Stone is going to play a big role. This is, like, a rumor that has been going around. And that, that Power Stones from that game are actually going to be put in the story and, and there's going to be a couple of characters from Power Stone. I, I think it makes sense, but I feel like this is just Bane Boys hoping this mm, is just going to happen. It's probably because of the whole Infinity Stone thing, right? Yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah. Mm, eh. Well, uh, the next question we have for ourselves is, do you think this would have been better as a Capcom series crossover instead of a brand new cast? Uh, I think it would have sold a lot better, yeah. Yeah. I, Let's just be honest. I think we're at the time, especially in Capcom time, where like they were just releasing so many new IPs, like Plasma Sword, and all these other games that like nobody even cares about, and nobody even remembers. Like I said, Rival Schools before. That right. having a new franchise again for no reason, and with a brand new cast of characters, 
was like I think a mistake. I think they should have went the the Nintendo route where they just like yeah we can make these new characters or we could just put Mario in it and sell eight million copies. Right. I mean, though there is precedence for um, crossover games being on the Dreamcast and it just not selling well, even though it had big characters in it. Cannon uh, Spike. Cannon Spike. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. Um, I think this would have done better because it's a fighting game and it was like a brand new. And it was fun. Like, it was a fun fighting game. I can see why Cannon Spike didn't do well. It's a top-down shooter. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of in an era where people were looking for more advanced games on the Dreamcast. I don't know. I think it would have done well. I think it would have been cool seeing, like, Ryu and uh, Rival School's character and uh, Mega Man all in one game. I think a lot of fans would have been pretty hyped for that. Yeah. But... I. Yeah, it, it would have had the comparisons then to Smash Brothers, though, because then they would have said, oh, it's Capcom ripping off Smash Brothers. But then again, I think people already do that. Like, they yeah, already do that online. They already, yeah. But, uh, I mean, yeah, you could, t you, you could read the quote that the developer said about the same issue. Yeah, yeah, so basically Capcom talked about why they didn't make Power Stone into a Street Fighter 3D game. And this is a quote from Matt Atwood, who worked at Capcom in the 90s. And I'll try to do my best Matt Atwood voice. Oh, um, yeah. <clears throat> it completely needs to be separate. The whole design behind it is to go in a completely new direction in fighting games. We will always love the Street Fighter series and probably always support it. But that doesn't mean that there isn't room for others. There's definitely room for a game like Power Stone. The characters are very unique. And it's not Street Fighter-esque in the gameplay at all. It's a much more strategic type of fighting game. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, I think Street Fighter Third Strike at the time that was out was way more uh, strategy-driven. Mm -hmm. I think he should have said that it's more of a party game for uh, a wider audience. And I agree with him, it's not like Street Fighter, so it definitely shouldn't have been a Street Fighter game, but... It could, it could open up for like a Capcom versus series or, or Capcom Smash or whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's very PR, obviously. What do you? Th I mean, what are your thoughts on the quote? Um, I, I get what he's saying. Maybe Street Fighter fans might have come into it and realized that it's not as deep as they're used to. Um, we know how, I guess, opinionated fighting game fans can be about how their games play, about the engine. And so maybe, yeah, to to make it a, a Street Fighter game might turn off a lot of people. Maybe. Maybe. Would it turn uh, you off if you played, like, I don't know, a uh, virtual fighter game and then you went in and it's actually Virtual Quest? <laughs> that, that would turn anyone off, I think. <laughs> yeah, I think so, too. But, so, you know, um, but yeah, th there were just so many fighting games at the time, though, at least on the Dreamcast. So I, I think it's good that they did what they did. Wow, a disagreement between us. But that's fine. I think I'm not going to get over this. I'm going to bring it up all the time. But Shit. Um, <laughs> so the game was like very legendary. I think now, I, when it came out, it didn't feel that way. I felt like it kind of went under the radar. Yeah, mm -hmm. they had a demo here, but it wasn't like people were like, Metal Gear Solid. You know, I mean, you know when Metal Gear Solid came out, everybody was just talking about how it changed gaming and it, Resident Evil changed gaming. I don't think that Power Stone felt that way at all. I, I felt like it was like just a little secret game that uh, a few people I knew would play with uh, after school. And right. that's it, basically. And that's fine. I, I kind of like that because it feels more personal, I guess. But yeah. now when you go online, everybody was the one, everybody was having it, you know, you're playing it. And there's, and there's a lot of people that really want a new game, I think. And I don't blame them. I think it there's a few things I think the game did wrong, but we'll talk about that later. Yeah. Um, but the game has been, like, a big success, I guess, in the terms of people really liking the game critically. It, it's made the top Dreamcast list on Complex, IGN, Games Radar, and even made Racket Boy's top titles that still matter today. In this. Uh, yeah. Do you agree, Barry, that it still matters today? As a game, like, if somebody played it today, they could be have fun playing Power Stone. Oh, yeah. I mean, it, it goes hand-in-hand hand with what I was saying initially, where when the Dreamcast came out, it was the first console where, by and large, 3D was not an obstacle anymore. And I mean that just not just for developers, but for, for players. You can play this game now, and you would not... You wouldn't be held... I mean, you might say, oh, it looks a little blocky. 
that doesn't matter. It's I beautiful. Think, I think it fits great with the art style, especially when you uh, res it up on an HD screen with uh, an emulator. I think oh, it yeah. looks great. So I think, imagine a Switch version though in 1080p and uh, 720p on the go. That'd be, that'd be pretty something. That would be pretty. I love that. Yeah. Uh, the official Dreamcast magazine uh, compared Power Stone to fighting uh, to fighting games. What the Chemical Brothers are to Kenny uh, Kenny Rogers? Yeah, they like to make jokes. <laughs> <laughs> the official Dreamcast. Uh, they found it uh, the game incredibly frantic and a true party game. Uh, they also noted that Power Stone is the first arcade game developed on the no- Noami. Noami? Naomi. Naomi? Is that really how you say it? Think Shenmue. Think Ryo's girlfriend. Naomi. Naomi. <laughs> yeah. uh, the games are, uh, str- well, the, yeah, not strongly recommended for newbies, but do you think that it was not newbly friendly? I disagreed with that. Yeah, yeah. ODCM, they had this article where they basically had two people. One was a veteran gamer, one was a newbie. I don't know if they were real people, but they were talking about all the games that they played and which ones appealed to them. And the newbie, um, like you read, said that it was really frantic and it didn't seem like the game for them. But it, they did say that it was at least, there was something there that made them want to get better at it. And I've experienced that too. I think I experienced that with uh, Virtua Fighter 2 on the Saturn. I was like, man, this game, I don't know, this is tough. I'm getting my butt kicked, but I really want to get better. And I think that's the sign of a good fighting game. Where there's a challenge, but there's also the, you know drive to get better i think that i mean but like that's kind of hard to put in there like one new noob uh experience was different than the other one like i feel there's a lot of games right now released where it takes some thought to get into the game but i mm-hmm. they've hit mainstream anyway like those moba games you have to click you have to farm you have to do last hits you got to do builds you got to do shops and it's all yeah. this complex stuff but yet it's getting millions of people playing it every day so it's kind of hard. Like I know people that play those games that don't play any other games at all. Like they don't like gaming at all. They just like that game. I, so, I'd say with a game like Power Stone, if you put a noob against a noob, it would be a lot more equal, and they'd probably both love the game. It, I can understand though. I've played it with people who don't know how to play the game, and I would just kick their butt every single time. And I realized that they didn't like the game because they weren't getting to play it. I would just turn into super mode and be like, you know, game over. <laughs> and well, they, Power Stone made uh, the official Dreamcast magazine's top veteran games list, and I'm assuming this is for the launch games because it has a, it was uh, the fourth game. I'm looking mm-hmm. here behind uh, Soul Calibur, Sonic Adventure, and NFL 2K. Yeah, these were the games that like the top five games you should pick up if you're a veteran player. Okay, that, that's a good list. Which one was the fifth one? If you remember. Um, I don't know off the top of my head, but I think it might have been, was Dead or Alive 2 a launch game, or Soul no. Calibur's on there? Soul Calibur's, to... are, Soul Calibur's the number one. I agree with that. I dig think that up. That game had a lot of content on it that made it pretty worth it for a new, mm-hmm. uh, for a new game list. I'm surprised I never picked it up. I didn't pick it up until the Dreamcast was dead. I can't believe Marvel it. Marvel vs. Capcom was the, the fifth game. Oh, really? Yeah, Marvel vs. Capcom is a big game. It's another, like, sort of, uh, I don't know, people do take it seriously, but I feel like the game's so broken that it's kind of hard to take Marvel vs. Capcom serious. Yeah, but I mean, Dreamcast, uh, just as mentioned there, it was the game for fighting game, uh, the console for fighting game fans at the time. Like, look at that lineup. That's amazing. And that's why I really love the Dreamcast. I, I, same reason why I really love the Sega Saturn. I think fighting games right now are in a super decline, but mm. uh, back then it was kind of the bread and butter on games like everybody I, I, a lot of friends that i i knew loved fighting games and will always play fighting games and that's the only reason they even cared about sega consoles was because capcom was so supportive with their fighting games throughout the years mm-hmm. and they had the best versions of each game so they had to get the saturn or the dreamcast mm-hmm. but and, uh, yeah, i mean dreamcast and it, and it was uh just going with the hardware because the naomi board was so similar to the dreamcast wasn't it it's basically a dreamcast the same. Naomi. Yeah. yeah basically uh it's made it easy to port games over but uh all right so this <laughs> uh power stone also got an anime produced by Perot. periot periot that's how you good. said that sounds good enough 
uh, who also produced uh, uh, Naruto, Bleach, and Yu Yu Hakuyushi or Hakuyusho. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's like I've seen people say Hakuyushi before, and I heard them say. I've it always seen it in print. I've never said it until just okay. Now. Uh, that's actually a pretty good anime, but uh, that's not what we're talking about. The series ran 26 episodes and adapted the first game's storyline and was later dubbed in English by ADV Films. Um, well, they added some new stuff into the anime before the second game release, like uh, Falcon's Butler, and he was later mentioned in Power Stone 2. Mm-hmm. Just little things like that. Uh, what are, Did you watch the anime, and what are your thoughts? I... So... I, I had the Power Stone anime added to the notes here because I had... It, it's not that interesting of a story, but basically the Power Stone anime was probably the first anime I actually owned and the first bootleg I ever bought. I uh, visited my grandpa down in Florida and there was a like a anime video game convention. I, this was like me at my worst, you know? Like this is me this... when I was like... I can't speak Japanese, but I want to be a Japanese man, you know? And so, oh, I was like, so this is when you started uh, falling in love with Japan. Yeah. And so he took me to this thing, and I remember I walked in. It was like this community center, and and they had all of these just fucking nerds. And this was Florida, too, so it was bad. You know, like, I, I'm not from Florida. No offense to Floridians, but you can imagine, like, an anime convention in Florida. That's a freak show. But, um... It was it was cool though because they had there was this guy off in the corner selling modded Dreamcasts and I was like holy shit like I always heard about these things but it was like you know seeing Bigfoot like you as a kid you wouldn't see a modded Dreamcast guy uh, and I was kicking myself for not bringing mine at the time um, but at one table they had all these VHS tapes and one of them was uh, the first I believe two episodes of the Power Stone anime on a VHS tape in Japanese with. Uh, you know, fan fan made subtitles. I actually found the tape not too long ago, so I'll, I'll dig it up maybe and do some Instagramming of it. But um, I really liked it. The music was cool. Uh, you know, it was it was in Japanese, so for me, I was like, well, this is legit. Any anime in Japanese is great. Um, <laughs> but but since then, I, I did pick up all of the ADV films versions. They're not as good. They changed the music. Uh, the originals are really hard driving, really fun. The new one's like, Power Stone, find your answer. <laughs> you know, something like that. Do you uh, think uh, you think an anime like that would help promote a game like Power Stone after you've seen the anime? See, that's the thing. Um, the, I mean, the anime did come west, but I, I don't think it did anything to really promote the game. Uh, I, I don't even know. I think it might have come after the game was like... Was dead, right? Yeah, I, I feel like it might have released around maybe 2002 or three. maybe. It just it did not seem like it was something that... You know, because it was it was out when the game was out in Japan, and when I had the VHS tape, the sequel to the game hadn't even come out. However, since then, like, the Dreamcast was on its way out, and then they're like, hey, ADV Films is bringing Power Stone over, and I was thinking, yeah, it's about time. You, you should have done that, like, two years ago. But, yeah, I, um, I, I agree. Uh, I did watch the anime, and uh, it was fine. I mean, I watched the ADV film version. I didn't think it was, like, anything impressive or, like, it was going to set new standards for anime forever. Mm-hmm. But uh, it was a fun little side thing they did. I'm sure they did it to promote the, the game in Japan. Yeah. Yeah, I'd say the best thing about it is the fact that the character designs in Power Stone are so great that it's just fun to watch the characters like interacting and running around and having a little more personality to them. But, you know, it, it basically plays out like a Sonic the Hedgehog, and like Sonic X, you know, where they're like, we got to get all the stones, we got all the stones, got to fight the boss, that's the end of the show. Thanks, guys, thanks for watching. And uh, you did say right now that you were super into anime, and it, that seems like, I know if some people that are listening to this are younger, mm-hmm. like the 90s, the late 90s and the early 2000s was basically like Japan took over all of America. Oh my god. They, they gave everybody Pokemon, Dragon Ball Z shit, and they like pretty much ruined our economy. And that's, <laughs> it's not Bush's fault, it's it's really Japan's fault, okay? Uh... I'm, just, I'm just letting everybody know this, I don't want to make it too political, but... There was a time when I wanted to be basically be a Rudy, you know, from like Jet Set Radio, <laughs> where I was wearing a skin tight shirt with like like silver lettering on the front about like pinball, and it was in Japanese. I had parachute pants with orange reflector tape, 
and I would sign, all, I would do all these drawings, I would draw like fancy star online girls naked, and I would sign it, you know, because Barry, I'd, I'd, I did like the Romanji or whatever, and it said Biri, and so I'd sign Ooh. it in Japanese, and I had my power, my, my anime shelf consisted of pow, a bootleg Power Stone VHS tape, the Sonic the Hedgehog movie on DVD, and uh, <laughs> I think that was like it. I only owned that, and I was like, I'm into anime so much. And let me guess, uh, your uh, your keychain had a VMU attached to it, just in case you needed to save or trade saves with anybody. I did bring my VMU to school for like a good six months in the event that I would encounter someone with a VMU. Yeah, <laughs> I, I knew somebody with a VMU, so we would uh, he would trade like. At the time, I didn't have internet because. Uh, Something happened with Sega and they overcharged us. So like we would trade like files all the time because he would be getting like, oh, I got the unlock file for all this stuff because he would download them on Planet Web. Mm-hmm. So I would trade with him at school and stuff, and I'd be like, I'm playing this game, and he's like, oh, I got, it. I could get a save file for it, and then yeah. he would do that for me, and it's like, so it was a cool feature, but I mean, we're getting yeah, off topic now. <laughs> Well, and yeah, no, but just talking about all this off-topic stuff, that really is what encapsulates Power Stone to me. You know, like, do you, have, do you ever play a video game and it's more than just the game itself, but it's almost like a time capsule of what was going on in your life at the time? Yeah, you, that's Power Stone? That's Power Stone for me. Power Stone for me is those awkward teenage years in the late 90s, early 2000s, where I was so excited to be learning about all this, like, anime stuff, and the Dreamcast was out, and there were new video games, and, like, no girls would talk to me. But, you know, but I had all of this stuff and I was like, I'm reinventing myself. Maybe I'm going to be like a really cool graffiti artist, you know, who can speak Japanese. (laughs) Oh, man. So artistic. Yeah. And so it just, I don't know. Power Stone definitely does bring out like those sort of awkward teenage memories of mine. uh, I think more than any other Dreamcast game does. And, uh, well, let me get on with the legacy. Uh, Go the, for it. the game doesn't have a huge legacy outside of the first two Dreamcast games. It did get a, the Power Stone collection on PSP, which mm-hmm. included both Dreamcast games with some extras, like playing boss, battle, uh, playing boss characters and having the second game's characters play in the first game. Not, mm-hmm. huge, not huge new things, but it's nice. Uh, prior to this, uh, char- characters from the game appeared in SNK versus Capcom uh, Card Fighters Clash on the Neo Geo Pocket Color, which nobody mm-hmm. played, so I guess it doesn't matter. But what are your thoughts on the PSP version if you played it? I've watched some footage of it. It looks pretty fun. I I was not aware that you could play Power Stone two characters in one. That's true? Really? I, 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 I've only played it like casually because yeah. uh, my brother is a huge uh, Power Stone fan, and he had it on PSP, so he would always play it on the go. And I don't know, I, I played a little bit of it, and it just didn't feel as smooth as the Dreamcast version. So I would technically tell people, just play the Dreamcast versions. <laughs> yeah, I, I would say that um, if you are trying to read up on the PSP version, there's a lot of like false information out on the internet about it. Maybe I should um, do a, a, a review of it or something for the site. What? Yeah, it's, it's interesting because, well, you, you were just talking about it, I was looking at the characters. Apparently Wikipedia right now is claiming that the butler from the anime is actually in the game. But that's mm. not true. He's not in it. Now they Google it in the middle of the podcast? I think so. <laughs> <laughs> it says he's the the annoying butler of Edwards, uh, Edwards and is told... Uh, and is told by Pride and Edward that he's overdramatic. Now, it sounds like they're pulling this from the anime. He is known as Don Quixote and resembles a knight when he uses the power charge. Again, this is something that happened in the anime. So I think some someone's messing with us. So if you think, if you're buying the PSP version for the butler, I wouldn't, I wouldn't. Yeah, don't. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's worth getting if you have a PSP and you're looking for a fun game. I'm pretty sure it's... It's going to meet your standards. It's still a fun game, regardless. Mm, it's Vita but, compatible, too. Yes, it's Vita. Uh, well, yeah, there you go. You can play it on the Vita. The, well, mm-hmm. actually, the PSP game does not have the VMU mini game. That's exclusive to the Dreamcast version. Right. And, and you could talk about that because you were a VMU fanatic growing up, right? Well, you're talking about the mini game for the sequel, right? Wait, the, the sequel had. Yeah, the sequel, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that was, that was really cool. It was a way to actually. Um, keep a file of all the items that you have and then you could trade with friends uh i i did actually trade with a friend at school he had i think the cat ears and i had the tail 
and so we were trading so we could get the whole cat outfit going together. Um, so that was that was a cool feature, and that's something. Yeah, you're right. The PSP does not have so. Ha. I mean, if they ever do a Switch port, which we just talked about earlier, I think it would be a great feature to bring back and stuff. Because I mean, when you have them on the go, it kind of you know it's both things, right? It has. Mm-hmm. So it could work. Uh, you want to t- want to talk about media in 1999? Oh, like, this is my favorite part of the show. Well, not really, but it's fun. It, it fills time. Um, so this this is us looking back at what was happening at the time of Power Stone's release in 1999 in America, because we're Americans. Uh, so let's see. Let's run through this list. So the launch of the Neo Geo Pocket Color took place. Tiger Electronics launched the amazing Gamecom handheld. I think you misused oh, yeah. the word amazing in the show notes. Amazingly uh, awful. I forgot. Yeah, yeah, awful. right. Um, Sony announced the PS2, because why not? Mario Party debuted on the N64. Wow, really? Yeah, it's weird. Wow. Huh? Now, when we're when we're talking about this game being a party game, can you admit Mario Party versus Power Stone? Wouldn't I, I'd go to a Power Stone party any day. Oh, yeah, uh, for sure. Final Fantasy VIII released on the PS1. Pokemon Fever continued with Pokemon Snap and Pokemon Stadium on the N64. Highly praised 2D fighters Street Fighter III Third Strike and Garu Mark of Wolves debuted. Sonic returned with Sonic Adventure on the Sega Dreamcast and Sonic the Hedgehog Pocket Adventure on the Neo Geo Pocket Color. And this was also the time that Sony took Bleem LLC to court for aggressively marketing the PlayStation emulators for P- emulators for PC and Dreamcast consoles. You remember, you remember that? You remember that? I do. I, I, man, I remember at the time I was like, I don't need to buy a PlayStation. I could just wait for the Bleem Pack to come out and I can play, what was it, like 150 games they promised or something? Yeah, they promised this, a shit ton of games. And I remember oh, telling my, my friend who was a, a, Playsta- a PlayStation fanatic, he was like, I love the PlayStation. I'll never buy a Dreamcast. It's fucking garbage. And it's like, uh, dude, and I showed him the screenshots when it was like, you could play Metal Gear Solid and it looks way better. And he still was like, they're going to get sued, watch. They're going to get fucking sued. And I was like, nah, they can't sue him. It's on a, it's on a magazine. It's official. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, they did sue him and uh, we never got all that, all those good uh, emulated oh, games on man. Dreamcast. It would have been great though, wouldn't it? Oh yeah, definitely. You know, looking at this, 1999 really was a year of transition and a year where the the market, or I guess the, the video game market, was really trying to figure out what they were going to do next. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you look at this, PS1 uh, had Final Fantasy VIII. Like, that's a major game, and it was still, you know, it was 1999. Yeah, yeah. it was already uh, like five years into the, the franchise, I mean, the, the console uh, life. Yeah, yeah, and in seeing here too, a lot of big name N64 games coming out, which, man, at the time, I was kind of a graphic snob, so I could imagine turning my nose up at all this stuff because of the Dreamcast. Um, I, and this is also yeah. the time where people like were mismarketed stuff. I remember Pokemon Fever was still like super hot, like it was huge, and I remember my cousin uh, pre-ordered Pokemon Stadium. And he was all, like, excited about it. He didn't read anything about it, because why would you do that? It has Pokemon on it. It's Pokemon on the N64. He thought mm-hmm. it was going to be a, he th- he thought it was gonna be an RPG in on the N64. What it actually was was a fighting game, basically, where you just load up your Pokemon, and then you fight them against each other, and that's it, in the stadium. That's it. There's no story. There's no... It's basically bare-boned. Wow. But yeah. Whatever. That's a, but yeah, there's a lot. The N64 was still alive back then. It was still dropping games and trying to, like, I guess, make people not care about the Dreamcast. Do you think mm-hmm. that worked, or do you think people were ready to move on at this time? I feel like people were ready to move on. I'm, I'm like reading these. I'm just kind of shocked that these games were still uh, coming out at this time. And did you have any history with the Neo Geo Pocket Color? Because, I mean, Sega had support for that. It was kind of weird because it wasn't a, a Sega console, but SNK and Sega had a working relationship at this time. I never owned one. I've always wanted to, but I 
I mean, of course, being a hardcore official Sega Dreamcast magazine fan, I would read about it all the time whenever they covered it. And like, ODCM almost acted like the Neo Geo Pocket Color was basically their handheld to cover, because I think they did some reviews. Um, of course, Dreamcast fans know full well that the uh, Neo Geo Pocket Color could connect to the Dreamcast with some games like uh, Cool Cool Tune and I believe Street Fighter or something like that. But yeah. um, it was a cool handheld. I, w I need to get one still. Yeah, I think it's worth it. I th that uh, SNK really, uh, was a very unique company, and I think they're very Capcom-ish in a way, where they oh, all have... Sure. So, I would, yeah, if you guys never played a Neo Geo Pocket Color, look it up, check it out. It's uh, There's some games in there that are hidden gems for sure that everybody should try out. Especially younger people that are trying to get into retro gaming. I think the Neo Geo Pocket Color goes under the radar for a lot of people because the Game Boy Advance, the Game Boy are mm -hmm. so popular and aggressive. Like, they literally took over the whole handheld market for so long. Oh, for sure. But, I mean, as evidence, this looks like it really was a time when some companies were like, well, Nintendo might be uh, on the way out or something, you know? Why don't we get our feet in the door, especially with the GameCom? Uh, say, <laughs> at this time, they were really still making some pretty good decisions. I think the Game Boy Advance was, uh, yeah, it was pretty good... Uh, answer to the Neo Geo Pocket Color for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, so, want to talk about the movies that came out in 1999? Yeah, here's some of the films coming out in 1999. Boy, what a year. We had The Sixth Sense. He was dead the whole time. That's the... Uh... Oh, plot spoiler! Uh, there was The Matrix. And, um, of course, uh, you know, the real world's fake and Neo's gonna save us all. Fight Club. He was um, in his head the whole time. He's not real. It's, uh, this is like the year of twist, right? <laughs> yeah. Toy Story 2. Uh, what's the twist there? Jesse was um, abused, was an abused toy, an abandoned toy. Yeah, she was dead. They're, they're all dead. dead. Yeah. They're not alive. They're toys. Um, American Beauty. Uh, Kevin Spacey kills himself. Kevin Spacey, that, the next door neighbor fucking tries to have sex with him in the end. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> That's the twist. Um, and then um, Phantom Menace also came out that year. Well, and I didn't put it on there because I don't want you to talk about it. I want to forget it. No, I'm gonna <laughs> talk about that. No, okay. I, I like I like Phantom Menace. Anyway, <laughs> what was your favorite movie from that year? Like Barry as a kid and Barry as an adult. Now, I'm gonna be controversial, bro. I'm gonna say it. <laughs> Phantom Menace. Phantom Menace. I saw it five times in theaters as a kid. God damn! I saw it zero. I saw the second, the sequel. <sighs> I did go see the sequel, and I got and I saw the third one. Dude, I that didn't... pod race in theaters. I mean, you can't see it right now, but I'm doing that that animated GIF of uh, of what's his name just looking at the computer screen Anakin? and doing the doing the yummy face. No, and, uh, oh, uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. You yeah, know Anakin. exactly what I'm talking about. Exactly. Um, yeah. Mine was probably at this time the Matrix. I thought it was really cool. I thought the whole idea, like just the stuff, like I, I was pretty young, so I didn't know the concepts of like futurism or uh, that you know that maybe one day in the future we'd be able to upload uh, kung fu into our brains and then just know how to do kung fu like little things like that was like what the fuck like what would you wait. upload into your brain uh, all the Sega knowledge in the world <laughs> now, make uh, me a master master gamer <laughs> pretty much right that's what you, as a kid that's what you would want right I want to be really good at Street Fighter I'm gonna fuck up all my friends yeah good luck with that anyway yeah. that's really gonna yeah. help you in the future yeah, it was basically a movie about a cheat codes, right? That you load into your head. It was like I Game mean, Genie. Even the fact that I mean, even the concept that maybe we're living in a virtual reality, which even scientists say could be a possibility, but it, 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 it did stuff like that that was pretty cool, especially for a young person like myself. Um, Toy Story Two was pretty all right. Uh, I, I, I don't know. I didn't like it as much as the first one. I know you might disagree with me on this one. Oh man. Those tears at the end, though, when they're singing about her, and they're like, "When somebody loved me." <laughs> and, and and as an adult, I think I appreciate American Beauty a lot more now, because uh, I didn't like it when I was younger. I was like, "This guy, this fucking, this movie is creepy as shit." What am I watching? Oh, I love that movie. Yeah. yeah, it's a good movie though. When you're like older, you're like, "All right, this starts to make a little more sense." When you're a kid, you're like, "Why is this guy trying to hit up a high school girl?" That's pretty weird. He's like a thousand years old. I mean, a thousand years old. <laughs> Uh, and um, I know we sometimes do this. I, I don't think it's going to work in this regard, but, you know, like 
Do you think these movies sort of influenced Power Stone or fighters at the time? No. I'm gonna say I'm gonna say they kind of. I think it's the opposite. I think fighting video games and you know stuff like that. I think it definitely influenced like a movie like The Matrix. Well, yeah, I, I would say for sure. Matrix anime is, video games. Anime and video games for sure influenced that. Um, so, what's your favorite movie as an adult? As an adult, looking back at these, um, American Beauty, that was a really great film. You reminded me, though, when you brought up The Matrix, when, like, I'm not a big fan of Matrix 2 and 3, but I remember at the time when I just looked at The Matrix as a single movie before the sequels came out, that was a really good movie. Like, I think that's one of those instances where I need to take the sequels out of my head so I can really enjoy it because I remember just the promise of that ending. I was never hoping for a sequel. I was just thinking, oh wow, he's gonna like wake everyone up. And just, yeah. it was one of those kind of open-ended endings that really made me excited. It, and you know, the studio wanted more more because they did so well. I think it was yeah. a mistake, like you said. I People say that the Animatrix or whatever, like the side thing is a better sequel, but I've never seen it, so. It's all right, that. it's all right. Make sure to follow us on iTunes, uh, Stitcher Radio, or you could download the MP3 on our SegaBits.com news post. You could also check us out on YouTube. Yes, we're on YouTube now, so if you have YouTube Red or anything like that, you could go ahead and uh, subscribe and listen to us there. Uh, thanks for listening, guys. So we asked our uh, Twitter followers what they thought of Power Stone at the time. Uh, <laughs> You, you phrased it eloquently. So for those grown-ass people following us, why do you like Power Stone? And uh, here's some of our replies. So at Tanner L-P-E-R, which I think is a long player, uh, he says, because Power Stone, Power Stone holds the answers. Power Stone will set you free. Power Stone will set you free. And that's the, uh, that's the anime intro lyrics. The terrible anime intro lyrics. Um... <laughs> uh, Stephen the Page said, "Welcome to the Power Stone world." I, I, I think they got it a little mixed up. I think they're quoting, <laughs> giving us bad quotes. Uh, oh, here's one. Spike and Tester has said that it's got a great flow. It's really hard to get 3D movement done in a way that feels right. They did it. It's also perfect, simple. I agree with that. We had um. Eliola09 and they said four player gaming still play on my Vita something love that game chaotic bliss oh they, they corrected themselves sometimes not something we also had Brave Spartan he said a nice cast of characters really fun gameplay neat OST and just to hear oh no a lot of the time oh right the, oh no <laughs> oh man we could do a whole podcast about the announcer on Power Stone but we won't um, and then the uh, last one I'll, hear, I'll read here is from Natty Cabrera 15 They said, Insane Combat basically invented the Smash Ball, different abilities for each character, crazy weapons, full 3D movement. So that's, that's what our Twitter followers had to say. I, uh, I, say I, 